What up, coordination? On the pod today, we have Simon Johnson, who is a professor of entrepreneurship at MIT Sloan School of Management, where he is the head of global economics and the management group. He was the chief economist at the IMF from 2007 to 2008, and he co-chairs the CFA Institute for Systemic Risk. Johnson's most recent book, which he co-authored with MIT economist Darren Asimogel, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, The Power and Progress, Our Thousand-Year Struggle Over Technology and Prosperity. The book explores the history and economics of major economic choices and technological choices, up to and including the latest developments in artificial intelligence. The book is out now. You can get it on Amazon or at your local bookstore. In this episode, we discuss some of the key themes of the book. So I'd say that the primary message here is that technology outcomes are a choice that are determined by the people in the capital, in the uh, people who are building the technology during a technological revolution. So basically, in this episode, we talk about what determines when new machines in production increases, increase wages and create better lives for people that are lower or middle class. What would it take to redirect technology towards building a better future? Why is current thinking among tech entrepreneurs and visionaries pushing in a different, more worrying direction? especially with respect to artificial intelligence. So the key message here is that history is not destiny. People have agency during technological revolution. And so we talk about that agency and how do we diversify the visions of what technology could be from the visions oligarchs, the people like the Zuckerbergs and the Bezoses and the Elons, the vision oligarchs, and how do we create a plurality of visions around what technology can be? So how do we speak truth to the vision oligarchs and create, uh, break the monopolies over the means of information and the vision of what technology can be. And we align on three key ways that that can happen. We can alter the narrative and change the norms, cultivate countervailing powers, and three policy solutions. And so what I found really interesting about this episode is that the caliber of Simon is huge. I mean, MIT and IMF, I don't think we've had someone with those type of institutional credentials on the podcast before. But I also just see um, a common cause in in creating a plurality of visions of what decentralized technology and technology for social impact could be. And I think that, you know, halfway through this episode, Simon and I just kind of like hit our vibe on on doing that. And I bring the 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 Regen Web 3 perspective, which, you know, in Simon's word is cal- cultivating countervailing powers and altering the narrative and changing the norms. And then Simon brings the policy solutions and sort of a traditional economist background. And so this was a really fun episode for me, and if you if you liked it, let me know. I, I think I'd like to do more episodes with people who have uh, credentials like this, if if the audience likes it. Simon has a book out now, Power and Progress, Our Thousand-Year Struggle Over Technology and Prosperity. Make sure to click the link in the show notes and check it out on Amazon before you start listening. And without further ado, I give you Simon Johnson. I think you're really going to enjoy this Greenfield episode, Coordination. Enjoy. Athena Dow is addressing the underfunded areas of women's health, such as menopause and endometriosis. Athena is a community-driven Dow, giving women a say in decision-making and funding the scientific breakthroughs that impact their lives. With cutting-edge technology like Molecule's IP NFT framework, they invest in research IP that ensures exclusive licensing rights. Athena Dow is raising awareness to women's health research, working alongside existing organizations. So join Athena Dow today to help change the landscape of women's health research. Simon, good to have you on the podcast and congrats on the new book. Thanks very much. The new book from a high level expresses the idea that technology outcomes are a choice. Could you explain that and tell us why you felt it was important to write this book? Right. Well, yeah, I think that is the key point, Kevin. And I think a lot of times, particularly in, in modern discussions, but also when you look at some of the history, people say, well, this technology was sort of inevitable. It was going to happen because these people you know, were empowered or, or just had a lot of money. And, and I think that's fundamentally wrong. I think that tech, all technology is, is our choices. And, and that's really important because it means that we're making some conscious, deliberate actions. Now, maybe if you go back to the 1800s, people were, were, were not fully capable of, of thinking strategically, but you know we're a lot richer than they were. We, we have a lot more uh, experience and we have a lot of cognitive capacity, both in, in, our, in our human side and in the, our ability to use computers. So I think it, it's, it's very appropriate. And if, if, if actually at this moment with AI coming, uh, in, in a big way, really critical to, to put those choices on the table and say, which way do you want to go? Why? And who's going to drive it? So it feels like maybe there's some like um, status quo or like uh, some sort of bias when you look at the history, you think that it's it was just deterministic, but it's actually anything but. And, and the people who are there making the decisions are going to are drive how it all unfurls. That's right. Of course, th- there's going to be a, an important um, 
you know, set of people who are already powerful in the pre-existing society, and they may try to impose their will through the technology that gets adopted. You see a lot of this in the, in the medieval period, for example, in terms of who controls the water mills and the windmills and what they force peasants to do and the way they extract uh, more uh, money and surplus from those peasants. But when you come to the Industrial Revolution, I think all the phases since the 1800s, there have always been new people coming through, new ideas and, and, and new capital, or they can tap into some of the old capital. And so there's always contention, at least at the elite level, and sometimes, and of course we saw this in the 20th century with the rise of trade unions, there's contention much more across different strata of society saying, hey, productivity is going up, but, but why don't I get my share? I need a high wage, I need a weekend off, and so on and so forth. And I think there's a version of that right now, uh, including you can just think about surveillance. How much surveillance is acceptable in the workplace as you walk around the streets in, in other settings? There, There's a lot of people who are already powerful who want more surveillance. And the rest of us, I think, should be extremely wary of giving into that. Well, you know, I, I'm curious what determines when new machines and production techniques increase wages, but also create other benefits for the lower and middle classes. Well, I think the first step is is the, is the, is the, is a key one to focus on, Kevin, which is if you, when you bring new machines in and you automate, and let's say you replace workers in a grocery store with self-service checkout, that does not necessarily increase wages because while you may raise average productivity in, in the grocery store, I'm, I'm selling the same amount of groceries, I have fewer workers, you've not raised the productivity of those remaining workers or the product if I was to hire one more worker how much would they produce for me and, and that's going to be related to their wage so that's a really key point to, to to remember is that automation by itself just automation particularly not very good automation which is what self-checkout is that does not necessarily boost wages okay now if we get better uh, automation more productivity gains for the for the additional incremental worker or if we get new task creation so humans doing new things because of what the machines have made possible. This was the case with um, when we got electricity into factories, when Henry Ford built assembly lines and so on. Huge number of new tasks in and around the, the auto industry. Then the demand for labor is going up. And then you can look at sort of power relations with labor. Do we have trade unions? Do we have other forces tending to push wages up? Minimum wage legislation, for example. Once you see things through that lens, Kevin, I think you start to understand that you have to fight for everything, basically. There is nothing automatic about technology change feeding through into higher wages or better living standards for most people. So it feels like maybe there's some new opportunities with collective organizing. Just, you know, when I think of unions, I think of something maybe like 50 or 70 years ago was was that heyday, but maybe there's some sort of future of collective organizing in the digital age is something that we'll see emerge. Yes, absolutely. I think this is a priority. And, and, and of course, you're right. 50, 70 years ago, we had industrial unions. We had a lot of jobs in manufacturing. We don't have that anymore. And even if we get a lot of more manufacturing production in the US, it's not likely to be labor intensive. But we have a lot of people who work in service industries, a lot of people in, in other activities. So there's a worker organization piece there. But I also think consumer organization, Kevin, is a key piece to focus on. Data ownership, data ownership, portable data, protecting property rights around data, around content that's created, like our conversation here. That is going to be a, a really key issue. And I think that that's central to a lot of discussions around Web3, of course. I, I'm wondering what it would take to redirect technology towards building a better future and particularly for the lower and middle class. I mean, a, a building a better future for, for everyone, not just the elites. Right. So I, I think it's about countervailing power in, in, in a big way. So what we're seeing, particularly now with, with generative AI developing extremely fast, is that a few companies, Microsoft, Google, maybe one or two more, maybe not, they're going to become immensely powerful and they're going to shape things in the way that they want to go. And a lot of that is about replacing humans. So so-called so machine intelligence, I think, is is very focused on the sort of consequences or the logic of the Turing test in a somewhat distorted fashion, perhaps. That's bad. Okay. That's going to lead to a lot of people losing their jobs, losing their autonomy, being frankly manipulated. If you want to go a better way, I think three sources of countervailing power we need. First of all, better organization and protection of, of consumers and generators of data of all kinds. Second is a lot more safeguards against surveillance. And that's something the left and right can agree on. Right, because nobody should want the kind of surveillance that we're about to get, not without a huge number of safeguards. And and third is a change in taxation. I think we need a, a shift in corporate taxes to be much higher on bigger taxes. So the tax rate goes up as you make more profit. And the reason for that is if we get these very big monopolies in in uh, over that's called the means of information, those monopolies are going to make a huge amount of money. They, they're already very profitable. They pay very little tax in part because they're they're good at hiding internationally. That's where the money is. Okay, follow the money, right, Kevin? That's where the money is. That's what you've got. That's what you've got to tax. And and the, what you could do with that tax system is also give those companies and their shareholders an incentive to break themselves up into smaller pieces. 
breaking them up is break up big tech is is a very appealing slogan. But how are you going to do it? What are the instruments you have? Going through court cases is going to take forever. And letting the regulatory state do it is is quite problematic and very unclear what the process would be. But if you give them, if you say, right, you're very big, your profits a hundred billion dollars a year, and you're paying thirty five percent taxes. If you're much smaller, you pay twenty percent tax uh, on your on your corporate profits. That's a very interesting proposition from a shareholder perspective, and that's a lot of pressure on management, constructive pressure, positive pressure, sensible pressure to break up. I mean, at this point, I've just got to ask, you know, this is a podcast that goes out to people on the Bankless Network, and it's mostly people who are into pro-social crypto. Um, I think that like the crypto take on on market pressures um, around, in, around information capture would be, uh, let's decentralize the whole thing. What the tech giants are good at doing, which is, you know, do providing hosting, messaging, compute. Um, let's decentralize all of that so that anyone can can run a node, and and then let's build applications that compete with the tech giants on top of that. Social networks, uh, financial networks, things like that. And you know, that's maybe the most crypto optimist version of, uh, of what's going on in crypto. But uh, you know, I, I'm curious just for your, for your take as an outsider if you see any promise to that. Um, obviously crypto isn't perfect and I want to couch it in like there's there's scams and there's hacks and there's and there's Ponzi schemes in crypto and I would I would not like defend any of that but I'm asking about like the good parts of crypto the people who are actually trying to create those decentralization uh, of the tech giants power what do you think about that as creating a market pressure uh, or consumer pressure on on the tech giants oh I, I think it's a great idea Kevin I'm fully in support I think Diversity of business models and trying to find way to make make try to find ways to make machines computers useful to people. So we talk about machine usefulness as a contrast to and something to emphasize relative to machine intelligence. The best way to get there is to have a, a plurality of business models. Lots of people trying things exactly in this decentralized pro-social interest way. Lots of competition there. Great. Um, the problem is you're up against some titans, right? And the titans control the data, much of which, by the way, they steal or they they obtain without proper permission. Uh, as far as as far as we can see, and so what you want to do is tilt the playing field, and and that's why the corporate tax idea is is, is very interesting. Really, um, tax the titans for their massive scale and the massive profits, and that's going to give more opportunity to new startups and challenges of all kinds, including from the Web three crypto space. The idea of like a plurality of 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 businesses that are providing these these services is is kind of what we see in the decentralization space. But yeah, granted that these tech giants have a lot of huge network effects and it's going to take um, a really great effort and a really strategically positioned network, I think, to counteract them. Do you think current thinking around uh, tech in, uh, entrepreneurs and visionaries is pushing in a worrying direction? And especially the new enthusiasm around artificial intelligence, like, are we on the right track? Uh, I guess is the way I would ask that question. I, look, I, I think there's a lot of enthusiasm for generative AI and, and there's a lot of fixation on chat GPT type versions of that, which is understandable. You know, it, anytime you have a big new technology that that draws a lot of attention. I worry, and, and, and Dron Asmoglu, my co-author, I worry a lot that people are being drawn down a very narrow path where they're saying, great, let's replace humans and find focus on ways to replace humans. That's the machine intelligence approach. And and we would much rather, I mean, there are people out there, let's be clear, and, and they're very smart people, and, and we'd love to empower them more who are saying, you know, actually, let's find ways to make machines more useful to people. So home healthcare rates is a good example. Home healthcare rates in Massachusetts make about $20 an hour. It's tough work. It's hard to get people into that sector. There's a lot of downtime because client, your client is sleeping part of the day. Other ways to enable those workers properly, appropriately within the regulatory framework to, do, to use that time uh, productively and get paid more money for being more productive. So that will be using some sort of technology, you know, a, a computer, iPad type uh, tool, for example, uh, that is a very sensible and appropriate space to to explore. We're finding ways to make people with less education more productive and earn higher wages because they're more productive. That, I think, is a key linkage that really needs a lot more focus. Is there anyone that you think is doing, uh, is anyone else who you think is doing it well or places where we could take inspiration? Well, I, I think there are some people uh, around the healthcare space who are absolutely exploring this. Um, and, and making nurses more productive is, is a key issue. There's also some interesting discussion around the education space. I, I think you know that's a bit. Of, it's a little harder to make progress there, perhaps. Uh, but there's obviously a lot of pre- a lot been a lot of pressure on on teachers. There's a lot of concern about how to provide appropriate um, education 
tailored to, to, to children. I think that, that's, a, that's a very fruitful space to pursue. I'm not saying you're going to make a lot of money in it, but in terms of social impact, it, it could be huge. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the idea of a productivity bandwagon. Yes, that, that's our term for the sort of conventional wisdom, which is, you know, don't worry, be happy. All you need to do is invent stuff. It'll raise wages, it'll improve health, uh, expand opportunity, and everyone will benefit eventually. Well, the problem is this word eventually. <laughs> Actually, eventually, if you look back at historically, it's 50 to 100 years in some of these technologies. And that, that's just not acceptable. No, nobody's interested in waiting 100 years, right? And, and the, the, way, the way that the, a lot of these um, technology improvements come through, they're, they're really quite skewed. So as I said, in the case of self-checkout kiosks, you may get an increase in average productivity, but you don't raise the productivity of that potential new, new worker you may hire. So when I present this to business audiences, uh, my students at MIT or, or, or people out uh, running companies, they're like, eh, you know what, we, we'll, we'll bring in more self-checkout for our coffee shop or whatever, but we're not going to pay high wages for the existing workers. Well, then we changed, we've changed the technology. We're using the new and best technology and no increase in wages. That's a problem. And I think that's exactly what we're going to get a lot of if we're not careful. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things that, that stands out in my notes right here that I took as I was preparing for this is just this idea that we need to get away from blind techno-optimism. Technology has done a lot of really good things uh, for our society, and we all have iPhones. I'm doing this interview with you over a computer and a, the internet, which is really a marvel of technology when you think about it. But this blind techno-optimism that all technology is going to lead to positive outcomes for everyone, I think, is is something we need to get away from. And one of the ideas that we have in crypto is this idea of adversarial optimism. You know, we're deploying technology in a adversarial world and there's going to be adversaries that deploy technologies against us or just the status quo can sometimes lead to, to people sliding in, in, into bad outcomes because they don't have the right technology or social outcomes or education and stuff like that. And so um, I found this idea that, that you have that we got to get away from blind techno optimism to be, to be quite profound. And I'm wondering... You know, in a world in which nuance is the enemy of common understanding, you know, you can't get an idea that going viral on social media when it's more than 280 characters. How do we how do we create that nuance around actual pragmatic views on technology? You know, what's what's the meme here? Uh, you know, what's what's the way that people can really understand ways in which technology is good and, and ways in which is bad? I, I think there's a lot of questions in there, but any reaction, I think, is fine with me. Well, I, I think, yeah, in search of the meme is, 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 is a good sort of uh, tag for the moment, uh, Kevin. And I, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say the John and I are expert on, on that, but you know, we, we, we are good at economics and, and, and pretty good at history as well. So we wrote the big book to try, and get, to try and really provoke debate and argument. And I think out of those arguments, some of which will be on social media, but we'll, give, we'll have a lot of live in-person events uh, uh, as well and open, open to everyone uh, as much as possible. And I think the point of that is to, is to see where the sparks come, to see what we can generate in terms of uh, pushback and, and, and friction. And, and, and that, in, in my previous experience around policy uh, over, over you know, several decades, has been that that's where you find the opening. That's where you find the message that you can really drive home. And, and then you, you want as many people as possible to, to adopt it. And my definition of success, Kevin, is when you sit down for lunch with somebody in Washington, D.C., and, and this has happened to me, honestly. They say, you know, Simon, what we should really do is, and then they outline the idea that you yourself put out one or two or five or 20 years before. And you're like, and that, my advice to everyone when that happens to you is you just sit there and say, yes, that is a good idea. We should do that. Well, I, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, obviously your, your experience at the IMF and, um, you know, at MIT and all these, all these places has uh, given you an opportunity to broadcast these ideas out. And I think that, wow, it's just such an inspiration. I mean, as someone who's trying to build a pro-social movement around crypto and bottoms up crypto that's actually good for the world, uh, maybe that's a maybe that's a goal that I'll set for our movement. Fifteen years out is sitting down with a policymaker in fifteen years and having them say, "Hey, we should use crypto for social good to deploy UBI to our citizens or um, quadratic funding to our citizens." And um, maybe that's something that we can set a goal goal for. And yeah, and just remember, key point: don't say "I told you so." Okay, that moment you want them to believe they invented the idea. You're like, "Wow, yeah, absolutely brilliant. Let's do it." Right. So. The, this is the corollary that invention, invention has many mothers and fathers, uh, is that people want to own, when, when they adopt an idea, when it, when it catches hold, they want to be, they want to feel like they had an original contribution to it. So recognize that and celebrate that and spread that. And in private, of course, you can have your own celebration. And of course, it's the outcome of, of the social impact, which is what we're all after. But I think it's, there's different ways to get there. And many people in crypto are obviously younger, but don't have a lot of experience working with policymakers and deploying those ideas out. So I think that we're kind of, we're evolving towards, towards figuring out what that looks like. But 
the intersection I see between my work and and possibly your work, I, and, and I I don't know, um, is is basically like we're trying to build crypto networks that deploy UBI or quadratic funding, uh, which is basically funding based off of what your group of peers think is important, not just you know, uh, not just what like the rich whales want want to see. So uh, we see like a pluralistic crypto economic network that can deploy capital to people who are creating good social outcomes as being one of the primary exports of, of our movement. And, you know, I, I wonder if, if that can be something that sort of creates market pressure or, or at least is like a lifeboat as technology and AI are disrupting the world. And, um, you know, it, 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 I'm starting to see glimmers of how our two visions may fit together, but, um, you know, I, I I'd be curious for what you would like to see out of the crypto ecosystem over the next couple of years as we build this movement. Well, I, I, I what I really like, uh, Kevin, about what you guys are doing and, and what you just said is you're bringing the money because you've got to bring the money, right? You've got to bring the risk capital. And then the question is, what, what, do the, what do the owners of the capital want to achieve? And if they want to achieve social goals, great. And if they, if they find certain kinds of risks in terms of social impact acceptable, what they want to take, fantastic. And I think that the what, what, I, what I think is the really sort of interesting intersection is are there ways to use generative AI or something like that in a, legi- in a, in a legitimate way that's respectful of people and, and, and the data that they create? Are there ways to use that to enhance the productivity and the income and, 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 and life circumstances of people, particularly lower down the social scale or education scale or, or in- income scale? I think we see these things around us, Can We see these opportunities, but they're not seized very much because the people who own, let's say, let's call it conventional capital, they're very focused on a sort of conventional return on equity, maybe adjusted for risk a, a little bit, or uh, just going for the massive home run around apps that are built on top of chat GPT or, or something. And this is this is a problem. This is what we mean by the, the business, the monopoly, um, development of mo- monopoly, uh, monopolies around the means of information, as we're calling it, um, is something that is, is a problem for market power conventional sense, but it's a really a problem in terms of business models. If 80 or 90 or 99% of, of all the capital that's available is going into developing apps for chat GPT, that's what you're going to get. But if you can get 5%, 10%, 20% of capital deploying in the ways that you're talking about, that's going to be very helpful. But we must pay attention to the policy context. We must make sure the playing field doesn't get too skewed in, in, in the direction of the titans, right? Because the titans can crush everything. We, we've seen this with, with Google's behavior, with Facebook's behavior, with, with other, um, the tech titans of the, of the social media e- era behaving badly. And, and that is something that we've got to take those lessons and apply them and push them hard onto the policy, onto policymakers. And I would recommend very strongly finding bipartisan spaces where we can get agreements. And I see one around surveillance and another one around data ownership and, and data protection and property rights, right? On which both the left and the right begin to have some tentative agreements. Those we need to drive home because that's going to help the the broader decentralized movement and, and decentralization of, of business models, I think, Kevin, is the key. Well, I mean, I do think the data ownership and property rights is something we talk about a lot in the Web3 ecosystem. There's uh, the, the sort of like meme in Web3 is that we're in, in Web2, we're all serfs on Zuckerberg's land. You know, you don't actually own the content that you deploy out to their network. And Web3 and blockchains, for all of their faults, allow you to have cred- a credibly neutral foundation where you actually have property rights over uh, something. And it could be as serious as a house or it could be as silly as like a monkey JPEG. But, you know, once you have property rights and scarcity around that, then you can start to actually invest in creating things on top of that that foundation. And so um, I think your insight about finding bipartisan spaces that uh that care about things like property rights and data ownership and i think you said surveillance was the third one is a key point for web3 people who are who are uh trying to trying to use this technology for for social good yeah i think privacy is a, is a key issue for everybody uh, on the right and left that, that's very important i i, I like the, a lot the analogy to serfdom uh in in the sense that it really is the case that almost all of us you know, if you go back a thousand years, and that's why we kind of start the clock in our book about a thousand years ago, we were all some sort of, our, our predecessors were almost all some sort of forced labor. We were tied to the land or, or we, were, we, we were owned by p- other people, right? And breaking those boundaries was key, but, but a, a very important way that the boundaries were, or the, those restrictions were broken was by moving to towns. So towns and cities uh, were not completely unrestricted, but you got, once you got away from the land and once you got away from serfdom, uh, then you had different, uh, more expanded opportunities. And I think that's breaking free from the serfdom of Facebook 
is a good way to summarize um, what this is all about. You know, um, and, and one of the other ways that we sort of frame what we're doing, and, and I see an overlap between my work and yours, is around this idea of the Matthew effect, which is like the cumulative effect of accumulated advantage, colloquially known as the rich get richer, but I think uh, also applies to matters of fame and status. Uh, like, you know, uh, Tom Hanks is getting more famous faster than than I am because he's got that accumulated fame that creates that network effect. And, um, you know, I, I think that what's interesting also about uh, about another thread I want to pull from what you said is this idea of the tech giants hoovering up all of our data and because they've got that aggregated data they're able to monetize it much faster than anyone else uh, is able to and so what are the ways in which we could uh, reverse the Matthew effect this accumulated advantage so that the poor are getting richer just as fast as the rich are getting richer and we're able to monetize our data without being beholden to these tech giants so that's another way I would sort of frame part of my work and what we're interested in doing and and i'm wondering how that fits into into your views and and what you've written about in this uh in this book well i think that's absolutely key kevin so if you look at what we know about where the data the training data is coming from for the generative ai we, we don't know everything that's a bit of a problem what we do know is they're getting a lot of it from places where they don't have full permission or uh, websites where where data has been illegally illegally broken out of of uh, restricted uh, domains and, and, and publicized. So there's already a big issue about the the property rights. They get images, uh, for example, which which you know is pretty expensive place to get your photographs. Um, but they're also, I think, being completely uh, plagiarized by generative AI. So the Getty Images business model could potentially be destroyed by the ability of AI to generate synth synthetic images based on training from Getty Images. Right? All of this is, is, a, is a big problem in terms, in terms of property rights. It's also, by the way, reminiscent of other technological transformations where it is completely standard, and you might even say uh, a core feature of those transformations, that you take something that's either common property or fuzzy property, you make it into private property, then you monetize it, then you consolidate it, then you make it into big profits, right? We saw that, we've seen that with land, we've seen that with, with um, rights of way, uh, we, 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 we've, we've, seen, we've seen that with uh, data uh, already uh, in, in, in terms of social media. So I think asserting those property rights and controlling them and making them portable, but of course what you also need there is organization, because I by myself cannot stand up to the feudal lord, right? The, if the, the bailiffs will come for me and you'll never hear from me again. But if we all get together, or if we move to the city, or we somehow change the political dynamic and process around this, then we have the Renaissance or, or, or some some other better path for the development of, of, of technology. So I think thinking collectively, looking for ways to organize ourselves. And what do we want? We want ownership of what we create. We want it to be uh, portable and we want to be able to organize it collectively. I don't think we'll get enough money individually from that, but collectively we can shape what technology can be built using our data. Right? So that, that is actually an enormous potential power in a moment where there are the multiple paths for how technology develops. Yeah, I mean, I love that vision of collective organizing as a way to create a counterweight towards the the monopolist's power um, or, or the oligarch's power. And, um, you know, one of the, the things that we're really interested in building in the Web3 space is this idea of DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, where we can collectively organize and collectively own property together. And hopefully the sum is greater than the whole of its parts with DAOs. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different flavors of DAOs. There's investment DAOs, there's protocol DAOs, there's impact DAOs and things of, things of that nature. But we're, we're kind of in like the first or second inning of developing technology that allows us to collectively organize across, um, across social distance, but also geographic distance and, and create better outcomes for ourselves. But it's, it's early days, but I'm seeing a lot of glimmers of, of, um, of ways that we could do it, and and I, you know, I also don't want to throw out traditional uh, local organizing and 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 you know co-ops and, and things that have uh, developed outside of the technology reign are are, are really uh, amazing tools for collective organizing as well. But I think that what's new is that we can do this at web scale with Web three, and I think that that's what people are people are really excited about. So um, a big yes and to what you just said. So I would draw the parallel with the uh, early or mid nineteenth century. When people who were pulled into big cities like Manchester uh, started to organize themselves differently, and they were using, of course, some of the tools that have been provided. In fact, including the key thing that you know people were living in cities and they're working in big factories together. The Chartists were a key political movement uh, demanding more democracy in in mid century eighteen uh, hundreds uh, uh, in, in Britain, a and 
the one thing they were missing that, that you have the potential to develop, Kevin, is they didn't mobilize money, right? So they, they were a social organization, political pressure, mass demonstrations, and so on, changed the political conversation completely. But they didn't create enterprise. They didn't build their own alternative path for technology relative to, say, large textile factories. Now we live in a different moment. Now we live in a very different kind of economy. Now we, we, there's, a, there's a lot more value in and around information. So I, I think that the mobilization of money and they're applying it to, for, for appropriate social purposes and you decide what's appropriate or the investors decide what's appropriate, work that out. I think that's exactly what this moment needs. Well, you know, I'm, I'm wondering what else this, this moment needs. And, you know, I, I, I'd say like, you know, keep let's keep in mind that you're speaking to a crypto audience. Most of the people who listen to this are either social change entrepreneurs, programmers themselves, so they can build these collective organizing tools. And we do have some of, um, I would say to the extent that Web3 has elite, uh, you know, keep, uh, we do have like elite Ethereum people that have had exits in the past and, and have capital to deploy to. So, you know, I, I'm wondering what would have to be true for us to support this vision and this this social movement that you're trying to trying to stimulate. What advice would you have for us? Well, I've, I've been teaching courses about, about Bitcoin and, and about crypto and, and more recently Web3 at MIT since 2016 or 2017. And, and we hired Gary Gensler to come work for us uh, before he obviously went to the administration. And, and, and he was an immensely you know, positive impact. And a lot of the discussions we've had over this long period of time, Kevin, are listening about you know, what is regulation? And to what extent is regulation empowering and enabling as opposed to stifling and distorting, right? So some forms of regulation absolutely do protect incumbents. And I said, we think of a lot of that, we see a lot of that around conventional finance. But other forms of regulation that protect consumers, uh, that protect I- investors, that give you transparency, uh, are, are, are um, I think, really, really positive to the d- development of, of, of new businesses. Now, if, if it's all about profit and all about maximizing return and make get rich quick, then we, I think that that leads into a lot of uh, problematic areas. But if it's about social impact, if it's about helping people, I, I think there's a much better potential cooperation with prospective, proactive, um, in, pro-innovation regulators. And, and I personally, I mean, Gary is a friend of mine. I don't talk to him now. He's at the SEC because he has enough people pressing to do things. But I think Gary is exactly the kind of person who can help you in the right conversation, move in that direction. It's really amazing. And I feel seen just that MIT is teaching courses on Bitcoin and crypto um, and sees it legitimate enough to tell the students that are going through the MIT program about the the tech. Um, where my mind goes to is 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 this idea of a redirecting technology um, in order to create social change. I mean, I have in my notes here that uh, from your book, altering the narrative and changing the norms, cultivating countervailing powers, and then also policy solutions. And I think that like uh, we in crypto can really focus on those countervailing powers, altering the narrative and changing norms is is where I would like to see us go. And then, you know, what you said about Gary and and the SEC and the policy solutions, I think, is maybe the, the third thing that was missing there. Yeah, look, I, I think the it's all a lot, a lot of it's about the narrative and a lot of it is about, you know, opinion and, and understanding. And I think the crypto world. You know, there is an element of the crypto world that you know got a, a bit of a bad a bad reputation. But I would tell you, we we ran our latest crypto course, um, half semester course in September, and we were wondering September twenty twenty two, and we were wondering, given all the circumstances and, and given the the fall in crypto prices after the pandemic, whether any students would take the course. We had seventy seats in the course and a hundred people on the wait list. And and for me, that's the key measure, which is: do young people see potential? Do they want to explore a space? Do they want to understand? Uh, the opportunities. And as long as they do, we're going to, get to continue to off- offer that course. And the course has pulled more and more, let's say, away from standard crypto to walk, walk towards more Web3. And that's great. We're, we're absolutely uh, in, in, in favor of that. And encouraging students at all levels to think about alternative technology paths and what would it take to move in that direction. That's a big part of what I, of what I, what I teach and what I work on. It's interesting to hear you say that you've gone from teaching about more Bitcoin and crypto to more Web3 and I think that as the ecosystem continues to evolve and adapt, there will be all these different niches and you may have to split the course into the courses about DeFi and then courses about impact DAOs and courses about collective organizing in Web3. And, you know, hopefully we won't throw the baby out the, with the bathwater because there are people who are using crypto for antisocial means. Uh, hopefully we, if you don't, you don't throw away the whole internet when there's a bad website. So I, I would, I would hope that uh, people understand that that there are different sub niches of crypto and and um, yeah and, and if you ever do a, a course on impact DAOs or 
or regenerative crypto would love to get involved in that. That's that's great to hear that there's been that interest from the students. Yeah, I think the student interest is is your best indicator. What do young people want to work on? What where's the enthusiasm? And and I think it's very very important, Kevin. And this is, this is also the student perspective that we put competing visions out there because a lot of technology development is about vision, and we never talk about it. economics. By the way, is almost entirely silent on the issue of vision. But what are we trying to create? What are we imagining? What what are, what are the goals that, that we have? What do we regard as acceptable means uh, of, of operation and, and, and implementation? Th- those are huge questions, and we see them when you look back in history. You know this the the, the cliche that history is, is another country. You, you you do see things more clearly. You say, oh wow, they you know Henry Ford wanted to do this this and this. Wow, that had a big impact, and some of that was acceptable, and some of it uh, was was deemed not acceptable. But we don't see it in ourselves, I think, enough, Kevin. And the best way to see it and the best way to encourage it is to have competition of visions, and but also put them before people who are 18, 22, 28 and say, right, which ones do you want to work on? And, and you know, sometimes it's they'll say, well, we like this direction, but we've got to go make money over here. I respect that. I don't, I don't give them a hard time for that. But I'm encouraging them to think when they get some autonomy, when they get some capital, when they have um, opportunity that they, they should push in more diverse directions. And of course, it's also possible, Kevin, that generative AI is going to displace a lot of jobs for relatively young people. We don't know this yet, but there's a lot of concern that you, you don't need the junior coders as much. and It's going to be harder in your 20s to break in to some kinds of firms. But my reaction is, okay, go start your own thing, right? Find that entrepreneurship space where, where people are not dismissing you because you're 23 and don't have a lot of experience. And then you become the empowered 23-year-old with your own version of generative AI that actually bumps you up in terms of what you can achieve. Let's 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 up, upset the hierarchies in that fashion. I think that that's that's a very interesting idea for for some some young people to explore. Yeah, the, well, there's certainly a subset of young people who don't want to be climbing the hierarchy somewhere else, but will create their own new thing. Um, and, and you know, I think that I would fall into that category. But I also like to remember that I'm very privileged to be you know born in the middle class as a middle class white guy in the United States, and not everyone will have that opportunity. So I think it's about creating that opportunity. And, and, you know, maybe creating those multiple visions is the way that you do that. The really provocative thing I have in my notes here from doing my research is that is the idea that tech has a vision oligarchy. So how much is our vision for the future of technology coming from Zuck and Bezos as opposed to bottoms up from everyday citizens? And yeah, I thought I found that to be quite a provocative term and a meme that there's a vision oligarchy, not just capital oligarchy. And creating that pluralism of visions, I think, is a, is a key point for what you said. Yeah, there's always a vision oligarchy. You may not see it because you, you sort of you think it's part of the you know unavoidable environment. It's always there. I think Elon Musk is a fascinating character in this in this way because on the one hand, some days some days he's very oligarchic. Some days he wants to overturn the apple cart completely. Some days I can't make any sense of what he's saying. But but if you watch what Musk who what Musk is saying and and, and what 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 swirls around him you can actually get these glimpses into the vision oligarchy, its challenges, its incumbents, and so on. And I, I think that's that it's very instructive to, to follow the twists and turns of his various proposals. One example of a vision oligarch, I think it's Elon. He's just seen, I mean, you know, SpaceX and, um, and Tesla are just, and, and then PayPal before it was just massively visionary for its time. And, you know, for, for me, he's, he's the prime example of a, of a vision oligarch. But I'm wondering if there's anyone who's really is there anywhere where this pluralism of visions is really starting to come together and and you feel like the competing visions are are really drowning out the oligarchs or at least being able to successfully compete with the with the oligarchs because I'd be interested to copy that and replicate it if there is yeah I, I think around um, public health we made a lot of progress during covid I, I worked with some amazing people All grassroots decentralized using technology trying to uh, provide testing get access to vaccines otherwise protect people who didn't have resources. And I, and I still do some of that work and it's, it's, it's quite inspiring. I think the, the, the problem of the worry at this particular moment, Kevin, is that the massive leaps in generative AI, I mean, we follow this closely and we talk to a lot of people in the industry and we've been impressed and, and surprised, frankly, by ChatGPT and by the, the, the speed of the, of the developments in this space. I think there's a danger that both the money to be made and the vision appeal or allure is going to tilt things back I- into, into a monopoly-driven uh, vision much more than anything we even saw on, under social media, uh, for example, or, or in, in the Facebook sort of prime time. So I think there's a, I think going to the, going to public health, looking at people with well-defined health problems that are not dealt with by our, you know, fascinating health system, which has a huge capability, but it's also massively expensive and enormously skewed towards privileged people. 
I think that is a very, very productive space. And there are fantastic. I always personally, in, in my work on this sort of thing, Kevin, find the people who, who are working on the problems, who have the customers, the clients, the, 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 the people they're trying to help, and then figure out how to help them. Right? I'm not an expert on childcare or nursing homes or senior living or, or uh, K-12 schools, but I know people who are. I know people on the, who are on the front lines. I know, and they can tell me what they need and what they're missing, and I can help them go get that stuff, right? And when we can learn lessons and we can channel it into the policy space. So I, I think finding, identifying your, your customers, finding the people who have that need, who are addressing the social purpose in public health, that's my proposal for, for you and your audience. Well, we will check that out. And I love that idea of people on the front lines having the most um, sort of fresh perspective because they're actually dealing with the patients. And if there was a way that we could combine that bottom up collective intelligence of the people who are perceiving on the, the front line um, with the organizational network effects and the capital of, of people who are working top down, that that to me feels like a pretty huge opportunity. So um, that's where that's where I would like to go. So some of the big breakthroughs in social purpose and social organization in the 19th century were again around public health. Uh, I think everyone knows of the story about John, John Snow figuring out that cholera came from infected water and his sort of individual entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship there. But I think it, people, it's right, rather, no, almost nobody knows the name of Edwin Chadwick, who was one of the first people who, who, who imagined, with the help of his friends and so on, but he imagined you could bring running water into people's homes continually and then use that water to flush the human waste and, 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 and food waste and so on out of the home. That was a massive revolutionary idea in the 1840s. That transformed British and, and other cities. And without that, we would not be living in the, in the cities we live in today, uh, at, at least in, in, in more developed countries, that, that are actually quite healthy and, and, and relatively clean places to live. So that thinking, like we, we should have public investment and then public and private partnerships to implement clean water, well-run sewers, and, and then to use that to improve public health statistics. That, that was completely new. And that was imagined, actually... Strangely enough, not for empathy reasons, but much more for for you know Benthamite efficiency reasons, which seem a little strange strange to the modern mind. But they were like, hey, too many people are sick; they're not coming to work. We need to ma- boost national productivity. Okay, well, that was one motivation structure. I think these days we have enough we have enough money, enough perspective to be considerably more empathetic towards people who have less than than than, than we do. And I would also say to, to or remind everyone, Kevin, that. You know, we, the privileged people in this country, which, you know, tens of millions of people uh, who could actually invent stuff and, and move things, we live in a world of 8 billion, 8 billion people, many of whom, most of whom do not have those same advantages. So the world is not short of problems, I can promise you. And, and, and those problems, many of those problems are amenable to appropriate application of technology, but you should not rely on Bill Gates and, and the other vision oligarchs to solve these problems because most of the solutions they put forward while well-meaning, I'm sure, are, are too small and too top-down to, to move the needle uh, completely. I've certainly enjoyed the conversation, but we are getting towards the bottom of the hour now. I'm wondering if there's anything I didn't ask that, that you want to say, Simon. Well, I, I think it's been a great conversation, Kevin, and I really enjoyed it. We covered a lot of ground. I think the one um, additional warning that we would put out there that we, we try to start the book with this is that sometimes these vision, the visionaries, the vision oligarchs, we're calling them, um, sometimes they could... Or many times, that the reason they're oligarchs uh, is because they've had so much success in the past, right? So we talked about Elon Musk. Uh, PayPal, definitely successful. Tesla has really changed uh, the conversation. SpaceX, okay, there may be some vanity element there, but it's, it's really it's quite impressive in terms of some, you know, shaping the conversation. But just because people have been successful in the past doesn't mean that they have the right vision for the next thing to come, including generative AI. And I think it's very important that we challenge we challenge the people who present themselves as the as the authorities, as the technology specialists, about you know from Google or Microsoft or any 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 of the other uh, big players. And and I think these conversations and the future technology is far too important to be left in the hands of the technologists, Kevin. I think we need people who understand technology, people who regard technology as being powering, but people who also say, hey, we, we have this problem with. Um, Childcare being way too expensive for most people, and that has big consequences for families, for learnings, for, for social inequities going forward. We must solve that problem. And then they batter you. They're like, no, show me the solution to this problem. I don't want to see technology for the sake of technology. Show me the solution to this well-defined problem, and I will take you to, to meet the people who are living in, the, in these circumstances that, that are just awful, and we must improve their lives. And, and I think that, you know, that social, let's call it activism, but, but also vision, from 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 wherever you want to take your visions, it's so important, Kevin, 
uh, today. We've had some of it in, in our human past and we've had some wins and, and we should celebrate those wins, but we've also had a lot of technological disasters from a social perspective and a lot of ex additional exploitation that's came from technology. Okay, in the past, they didn't have the advantage of, of our resources, our understanding and, and the experience uh, that, that we can draw on. We must not make those kinds of mistakes before. Don't leave technology in the hands of the technologists. I love that. And, you know, the one of the primary messages I get out of your book is that history is not destiny. People have agency. And that's the kind of the seed of hope for me is that um, is that we can actually steer this ship collectively as a movement and and as people who are working on this frontier. And I think that your book, Power and Progress, or a, a Thousand Year Struggle Over Technology and Prosperity is a great guide to doing that. I would encourage the the listeners to pick up a copy of the book. There will be a link to the uh, link to the book in the show notes. And Simon, thanks so much for coming on. I really enjoyed the conversation. I think that I hope to steer the crypto movement slightly uh, using my agency in, in the right direction. And 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 thanks for adding your own flavor of, of vision to the uh, to the conversation. Well, thanks to your leadership in this space, Kevin, and thanks for uh, this opportunity. Uh, it really means a lot to, to me and to Deron, and, and I hope we can keep this conversation going and, and talk again soon as, as we see progress and as we can celebrate progress and as we can encourage people to move it in, in these kinds of directions. Yeah, well, it's been a great conversation. I really have enjoyed having you. So we'll have a link to the, uh, the book, Power and Progress, Our Thousand Year Struggle Over Technology and Prosperity in the show notes. Is there anything else you'd like to direct the listeners' uh, attention to? Before we wrap the episode, I think we we do steer the ship, Kevin, but without sometimes realizing it. And and we we mustn't be sheep. No, no offense to sheep here, okay? But we mustn't be manipulated and pushed in 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 the direction that the division oligarchs want to go. We have to recover our agency. And I think your movement and and your followers and and, and your friends are, I, I think, going to be a key part of that. Yeah. Well, uh, from the vision oligarchs, we'll move towards the vision plurality. And uh, I'm a big fan of that. Simon, thanks so much for coming on the Greenfield Pod. My pleasure. Thanks a lot.